Hebrews in chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We are continuing through this uh, chapter of faith. Now as I was um, planning on going through the book of Hebrews, I was not planning on spending this much time in Hebrews, but there's a whole lot in here, chapter 11, on uh, everything that he is trying to teach us and remind us on faith. The Old Testament... A lot of times we think that, uh, well, that's the Old Testament is the law and the New Testament is faith. No, they're both the law and they're both faith. They are. And that's what he's trying to tell in Hebrews. Uh, the thing that you see in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were to be done by faith. The way that Abraham, Moses, and all those people lived, they lived by faith. And that's what he's telling in Hebrews that, uh, look, there is a Christ now, and you are part of the church of Jesus Christ, so uh, you're not part of uh, the nation of Israel, so you're not really under the uh, Mosaic law, per se, for a nation under a theocracy, under the headship of God. But, uh, needless to say, we can go back to these examples of all these men that he's listed here in Hebrews chapter 11, and say this, they all lived by faith. And he's been teaching us some lessons on faith that each one of those uh, characters in the Old Testament, and when I say characters, I don't mean like these fictional characters. I mean they were real people that really lived just like me and you. And God used them in a tremendous way because of their faith. Now he's been building, and I say this every week because this is, I'm trying to give us a context here, that he's been building up to this point because the Hebrew Christians uh, were struggling because of persecution and many of them were discouraged. And so he has been pointing to the struggle and kind of giving them some little evidences of things going on in their lives to show them that your struggle is a faith struggle. The reason why you're struggling to go back to Judaism or to quit on your church or to quit your faithfulness to God and not attending the services faithfully, he lists many things, is it's because of faith. And he tells them, the just shall live by faith. Now you may want to go back to the Judaic system, but may I just say, to say this, encourage you, that Abel lived by faith. Enoch lived by faith. Noah lived by faith. Abraham, Sarah, Joseph, Isaac, Jacob... Moses, they lived by faith. And he's pointing them that the reason why, they, or the fact that they're in this passage and they were able to live a life of faith is because of their confidence in God and His Word. The Bible says, without faith, again, it is impossible to please God. We cannot please God except by faith. Now, we're looking at one verse this evening. I know you all. Oh. One verse? <laughs> this is going to take a while. <laughs> but Hebrews 11, verse 27. The Bible says, By faith he, that's Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now I want to draw your attention to again verse number 24. Where the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We established last week that that was when he was 40 years old. He tried to take things into his own hands and saw himself as the deliverer of Israel. And he killed an Egyptian who was one of the taskmasters there. And to try to overthrow, I guess, in his own power. Uh, because he knew that that's what God had called him to do at 40 but now when we get to read verse 27, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, now he's 80. There's 40 years that have passed from verse 24 to verse 27. And this evening, as we look at this one verse, I want us to consider this thought this evening. We consider the exemplary consistency of faith. The exemplary consistency of faith. Now we could go back to look at uh, Moses when God called Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. And there seems to be some resistance there uh, on the part of Moses. But let's not discount the fact that it says, well, Moses was not trusting God. No, Moses saw himself as incapable of doing what God called him to do. There's a difference there. Because he ended up making the decision and saying, you know what, I'll obey you to the Lord. I'll go. I just don't think I'm capable. 
But needless to say, he obeyed in the midst of all his excuses. And so I want us to consider here the exemplary consistency of faith because from 40 to 80, the same faith that you find in verse 24 is still there in verse 27. Forty years later. So as we look at this verse, first of all, we see the persevering of faith. The persevering of faith. Now again, verse 27, he says, by faith. Faith. And as I mentioned here, that this is again a continuation of the life of Moses. It started, remember, with his parents, Amram and Jochebed, who had faith, who saw something special in Moses that nobody else saw in their own children, and therefore they, by faith, uh, kept him safe and uh, saw something, saw in him a deliverer. And they did that by faith, and so that faith was passed on to Moses, and Moses, as he was 40 years old, he made a decision not to enjoy the pleasures in Egypt, but to separate unto the Lord and to fulfill what God's calling was upon his life. And so here we notice the persevering of faith, but we notice this persevering in the midst of several things because we're we're, we're counting here on 40 years. And this is a pretty consistent faith for being still there after 40 years. He's 80 now. We would say, Moses, it's time for you to slow down. You know, don't attempt anything for God at this stage in your life. It's been for 40 years. Perhaps he forgot all about what God had called him to do and what God had placed on his heart to do. Now, when he attempted to do do these things early, he attempted to do these things, although he did those things by faith in God and his calling, he attempted to do in in the strength of the flesh. And he was incapable of accomplishing that in the strength of the flesh. But notice the persevering of his faith. First of all, we see the persevering in the decision that he made. He made the decision 40 years prior to that, and it may be hard to survive a victory than to survive a defeat. In other words... When Moses made that decision 40 years ago, it was a great decision to make. It was a good decision to make. What was the decision? Notice verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And we applaud Moses and we say, what a great decision, and may we all make that decision as well. But what I'm submitting to you here is that he survived the decision of a victory in his life, of making that decision of walking by faith, of making that decision to forsake Egypt and to esteem the riches of Christ, greater riches than the riches of Egypt. It was a wonderful decision, but sometimes after we walk by faith and make a decision for God, we decline in our faith and drift back into the flesh. Why? Because we become self-confident, self-absorbed, and we say, well, look at now what I've done. Look at the decision that I've made, and our boasting causes us to go back to the flesh. And may I say, it's been for 40 years, and 40 years, Moses is not satisfied with the decision and say, oh, I'm good now. No, he was persevering in his faith. We have to be careful because sometimes we can make a decision and have a great victory in our lives. May I say that the victories are dangerous. There's a great potential in the victories. Because many times we can become self-dependent. 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So we see the persevering of faith in the decision of Moses, but also, number two, not only in his decision, but we see his persistency or his perseverance of faith in the desert. Now, not only did he make a decision, but for 40 years... He was in the desert. Now he had spent 40 years in the desert after 40 years in the palace. I think we could notice off the bat there's a big difference there. From the palace for 40 years to the desert in 40 years. He went from being a prince to being a shepherd. Now the Egyptians, they despised shepherds. They despised them. You remember when uh, Jacob sent his sons over to get uh, corn from Egypt, he did not want them to appear as shepherds. Why? Because the Egyptians despised the shepherds. And so we see here that uh, 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 Moses, who was a prince for 40 years, who had uh, really the status of a prince, had the power and the prestige, now he's been in the desert for 40 years working for his father-in-law as a shepherd. 
You know, this kind of demotion can be very hard for one's faith. Because the decision that he made was the right decision. It can be ex exciting to make a great decision, but when the decision results in a desert, it can shake one's faith to the very roots. Sometimes we can get the idea, well, I've made a great decision for God, and because I've made that decision for God, that's going to approve my condition. It's going to improve my status. It's going to uh, get me a raise. It's going to improve uh, my job situation. Whatever the case may be, uh, we see that David uh, or Moses was persistent, not only in his decision, but in the desert. When he was a whole lot lower than he was for the first 40 years of his life. You know, sometimes we look at God and because the result of our decision seems to be a dry place, we can get discouraged in our faith and quit on God. But not Moses. So we see the persevering of his faith in the decision in the desert, but number three in the disappointment. You know, in Acts chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible describes for us Moses as he was trying to do something for God. The Bible says he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. The children of Israel, as Moses was, came to them and basically said, Hey, God has called me to deliver the children of Israel. And they were like, Who made you? Who, who said? Who said? You think you can just promote yourself and say you're going to be the deliverer? I don't think so, Moses. Uh, but now, he, that was referring to Moses' first attempt to deliver Israel when he was only 40 years old. The children of Israel did not see Moses as their deliverer. So think about it. Moses had faced a significant disappointment when his own people that he was stirred to deliver said, You are not our deliverer. His grand idea to deliver Israel was rejected by the Israelite. It takes strong faith to survive disappointments. Can you imagine Moses said, he made the decision, I'm going out of the palace because I want to identify with the people of God. And then as he identifies with the people of God, the people of God said, we don't want you. Can you imagine the disappointment? But his, he persevered in his faith because his faith 40 years later is still as strong. Although he's been rejected by God's own people. Sometimes people get excited in the Christian life. They're perhaps young Christians or they're learning a lot about the, the Lord and about His Word and they're stirred up about the things of God. And then some Christian comes along the way and discourages them. And many times faith can be weakened in a person's life because of God's people. Because of disappointments. Because of perhaps certain expectations that was there when Moses thought, well, I'm giving my life to the Lord and I said, yes, I'll trust you by faith. I'll be that deliverer that you want me to be. And then the own people that God called me to deliver say, you're not called to be delivered. But his faith was persevering. We see it persevered in the decision, in the desert, in the disappointment, but fourthly, in the decades. It's been 40 years. Forty years after his faith was ignited to action, he is involved in the greatest venture of his life in, e in leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses' faith survived four decades. That's a long time. It takes great faith to survive year after year after year. Now, 40 years is quite a long time. It's a long time. But yet, when we find Moses in that place, he still has faith in God. And may I say that God will stir our hearts at times along our lives, and many times He kind of ignites and places a conviction and perhaps a calling in our lives and stirs our hearts about something and that He wants to, us to make a decision to follow Him in that area and to obey Him in that area. But many times as the years keep going and as we kind of sit there in the desert and we think that we don't see a whole lot happening in what God in, in our endeavor to follow the Lord by faith, and many times over the years, as the years go, on, our faith can slowly wane. But not Moses. Not Moses. So we see the persevering, persevering of his faith in the decision, the desert, the disappointment in the decades. But secondly, we see the forsaking of faith. The Bible tells us here in verse 27, by faith he, what? He forsook 
Egypt. Now, we saw earlier that the Bible says he, notice, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And he says here, for by faith he forsook Egypt. And so we have the idea sometimes, people look at this verse, as we'll see, he forsook Egypt, uh, when he had to flee because he killed an Egyptian. And Pharaoh heard of that, and so therefore he had to leave. John Butler writes, says, Does it refer to the time Moses left Egypt and fled into the desert at the age of 40? Or does it refer to the time when he led the Israelites out of Egypt to go to the promised land? The answer is not hard to find. The key is in the next sentence in our text, which says, Not fearing the wrath of the king. The first time Moses left Egypt, he did, he did so because he did fear the wrath of the king and he feared for his own life. But the second time he leaves Egypt, he's leaving not fearing the wrath of the king. So this forsaking of Egypt is talking about going out of Egypt with the people of Israel. In Exodus chapter 2 verse 15, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, uh, that, that Moses killed the Egyptian taskmaster who had been mistreating the Israelite slave, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses uh, fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. So it is clearly when Moses was exposed, he fled because he feared for his life, but this is not talking about that forsaking uh, the land of Egypt. This is talking about leaving the land of Egypt, forsaking this God-forsaken land. Egypt is a picture of the world. That's what it's a picture of. It's a picture of idolatry. It's a picture of the Pharaohs were worshipped as gods. And everything in Egypt, and we know that the influence of the Egyptians was creeping into uh, the nation and the Israelites who in turn began to worship uh, false gods and were uh, involved in idolatry. And so here we see the forsaking of faith. The forsaking of faith is a forsaking of the world. It's a forsaking of Egypt. It's a, a place where we must come out of unto something else. And so really we see three things that were forsaken as they forsook, as Moses forsook Egypt by faith. It was a faith venture. God didn't tell Moses the steps. Well, you're first going to go out, and then you're going to go, and you're going to go in front of the sea, and I'm going to open it up, and the Egyptians are going to come behind you, and then they're all going to... There was no plans. Just go. They were to go. Unto a land that God would promise, had, had promised to them, to their father Abraham, and so they knew of that. They were to go. And may I say they were to leave Egypt. They were to leave the world. May I say that when we forsake Egypt, we have to do the same thing by faith. We have to forsake, leave the world. I see three things that we have to forsake. First of all, we see the forsaking of sin. Egypt was morally corrupt. It was not a place of good influence for the people of God. Egypt had to be forsaken in order for Egypt to get out of their hearts. Uh, you see, much of what had taken place uh, in Egypt was had affected the children of Israel. We see that evidence uh, of the Egyptians' influence upon them in the wilderness wanderings. Uh, when you hear them complain, when you hear them erect a false gods out of all the gold that they turn in, where did that come from? It came from Egypt. You see, that influence that was there in their minds and in their hearts came because of all the time that they spent in Egypt. And Moses, by faith, is forsaking Egypt. He is forsaking sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. May I say that, pop, that, that uh, uh, purity is not popular, but it is for the Christian life. As some have said, if you lay down with dogs, you will rise up with fleas. And all that time that the children of Israel have dwelt in Egypt, their minds and their hearts had been influenced by the world, the Egyptian world, the false god, the immorality. All those things had crept into their hearts and their minds. So there has to be a forsaking of sin. There also has to be a forsaking of statues. 
I'm talking about idolatry. Egypt was full of idolatry. And may I say that when God defeated Egypt, He defeated Egypt at, at the height of its power. Uh, most historians would agree and most commentators would agree that when Moses came and when Egypt was defeated by God through the ten plagues, it was at the height of its power. And then when Moses come along, the Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. Each of the plagues were directed at a god. Each one of them. From the frogs, to the lice, to the Nile River, to the firstborn son. These were all gods that the Egyptians worshipped. Those are the message from God. Uh, and so when Moses by faith forsook Egypt, he forsook not only sin, but he told Israel to forsake the statues. What was the request of Moses? you remember when Moses made the request to favor? What was the request? Let's go to Exodus chapter number 5. Let's go there, Exodus 5. Notice Exodus chapter number 5, uh, verse number 1. Exodus 5, 1. The Bible says, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Notice here, he's not saying, Let my people go so we can go to the promised land. He's saying, Let my people go so we can hold a feast in the wilderness. He says in verse 3, After Pharaoh says, Well, who is the Lord I don't, that I should obey him? And let Israel go. Verse 3, And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. In other words, the nation of Israel was given to idolatry. And Moses' request from Pharaoh is, We need to get the people out of idolatry into a place where they're worshiping the true and the living God. There had to be a forsaking of statues, a forsaking of idolatry. We read last week about Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 5 through 10, where the nation of Israel as a whole, that's why the faith of, the Moses, of Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, was so great, because most of the nation of Israel was given to idolatry. So Israel needed to get away from Egyptian idolatry so that they could be taught the truth from Jehovah God. The, Egypt, the Egyptian churches today, if you would, must be forsaken for a church where the truth is taught and declared. We don't want to be in the church where the world is. We want to be in a church where the truth is. The truth of God. Where the holiness of God is being communicated. And that's what Moses wanted. That was the request of God. We need to go out because we need to worship the true and the living God. Sin must be forsaken. Statues must be forsaken. And thirdly, slavery must be forsaken. When he forsook Egypt, they were coming out of slavery. You know, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. They needed to leave their life of slavery for a life of freedom from bondage. By faith, Moses, when he said, by faith, he forsook Egypt. They were forsaking the sin that was in Egypt, the immorality in Egypt. They were forsaking the statues. They were forsaking the idolatry in Egypt. But they were also forsaking the slavery, the bondage, uh, all the labor that they were going through uh, that were, would cause them to have a hard life and a, bitter, and a bitter bondage. You don't have to dwell in slavery. You can be delivered. And we know how the deliverance happened. They uh, put the blood on the doorpost so that when the death angel came by and he saw the blood, he passed over. That's why they called it the Passover, so that they wouldn't have to have the firstborn die. They could all go free. And from then, when the firstborn died out of Egypt, that is when they experienced deliverance, when the blood was applied on the doorpost. And now the Passover has come and Jesus has passed over their sin. Is the picture for us there. It is a deliverance from slavery. Salvation today is a deliverance from the bondage of sin. So when Moses, by faith, forsook Egypt, he was forsaking sin, statues, and slavery. And we have to do the same today. You know, perhaps when the children of Israel were sitting there as they were worshiping idols and false gods, perhaps they thought to themselves, well, I can't see God and He's done nothing for us here. 
Therefore, I'm going to put a statue. I'm going to get something that I can see, touch, and feel. You know, human nature is the same today. People want something they can feel, feel, touch. They want an experience in a church, something they can feel. They want to look at something they can see. And they're not satisfied by faith. You see, faith forsakes sin, statues, and slavery. So we see not only the pers persevering of faith, the forsaking of faith. Number three, we see the convincing of faith. Now, I want you to notice the Bible says in, again, Hebrews 11, verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. It seems that Moses was convinced about something. Although the king was very powerful, the Pharaoh was very powerful, was worshipped as, as a god, uh, Moses, by faith, did not fear the king. He was convinced by faith. In other words, Moses knew that God had not called him to bring the people out of Israel, and then when he stood before Pharaoh, Pharaoh would kill him. Because God had made a promise. My people will be delivered. It's going to happen. So by faith, Moses did not fear the wrath of the king. May I say the convincing of faith, we see that in two ways in this passage. We see, first of all, it, convinced, it is convinced in Pharaoh's opposition. The Bible talks about here the wrath of the king. You know, Proverbs talks a lot about king and the king's power. In Proverbs 19.12, the Bible says the king's path is as the roaring of a lion. Proverbs 19.18 uh, says the wrath of a king is as messengers of death. The king of Egypt was a very powerful man. The Egyptians regarded their king as a god. He was to be worshipped. Pharaoh could speak just one word and have Pharaoh and Moses executed on the spot. That was it. To not fear the power of this great king took faith on the part of Moses. It was by faith that he did not fear the wrath of the king. So he was convinced, convinced in Pharaoh's opposition, but he was also convinced of God's omnipotence. God obviously restrained the wrath of the king. God was in all of that. Now, I don't know what you think, but you know, Psalm 76 verse 10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Speaking of God, the remainder of wrath he will restrain. Why Pharaoh did not execute Moses and Aaron is really a mystery that is only solved by noting that God controls the wrath of man. You see, God was in control there. And to me, I think that in any society we would say, wow, any king would have said, who, who, who are you? Are you kidding me? I am a god. And I can kill you on the spot. And after ten plagues, appearing before Pharaoh time and time and time again, common sense says, get rid of the leader. And that ends it all. But by faith, Moses was convinced of Pharaoh's opposition, even though in Pharaoh's opposition, but he was also convinced of God's omnipotence and say, God is in control. You know, Exodus 14, 8 through 10 says, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, he pursued after the children of Israel, and he overtook them. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel were sore afraid and cried out unto the Lord. Uh, later, uh, when uh, Pharaoh finally lets them go, he actually doesn't let them go. They go kind of away, and then Pharaoh says, Oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to let that happen. Let's go after them and kill them all. And then Exodus 14, 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What did Moses say? What did Moses say? He said, Fear not. Faith does not fear the worldly kings, but rather fears the heavenly king. You see, faith is convinced, even though there's opposition, it is convinced of what? Of the omnipotence of God. That God is all-powerful. And rest its confidence in the fact that God will not allow anything to take place in my life that I cannot handle. 
He will not suffer any man to be tempted above that of what she's able. But, with, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You see, God is omnipotent, and so Moses had to recognize, and may I say that is the convincing of faith. We also see the, not only the convincing of faith, the forsaking of faith, the persevering of faith, but we see, number four, the enduring of faith. There was an interesting word in verse 27. It says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. Now, that word endured, the word translated endure, is found only once in the New Testament. I'm talking about the Greek word. Only found once. It is a strong word. One commentator says, it says this word indicates strength of or fortitude to, that bears evils, undergoes dangers with resolution and courage, so as not to faint beneath them, by, uh, but to hold on to the end. The word endured speaks of Moses' great steadfastness. He did not quit. His faith kept him going in spite of all the obstacles in his path. Faith causes us to endure through difficult times. Faith is not revealed in the absence of trouble. A person's faith is revealed in the midst of trouble. And now he handles the trouble. But may I say he endured through three things as we trace those 40 years. He endured, first of all, through objection. You know, Pharaoh continued to deny Moses his request time and time again. Pharaoh even seemed to get harder and harder throughout all those plagues. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Harder. And he became stronger. And he made the bondage over the children of Israel even stronger. It took, think about it, ten plagues for Pharaoh to finally yield to Moses. I wonder how many times, perhaps during difficult times, uh, that we uh, seem to endure, but then as soon as, uh, as objections come, as a no comes, uh, and then we all, all, all of a sudden shrivel up and say, oh, well, I guess God is not alive. Well, I guess God can't be trusted. You see, he endured through objections. Ten times. And then finally, deliverance comes. And then you think deliverance comes and then they'll come back after you. <laughs> but see, all those objections, his faith was consistent. Although the, king, the king's opposition, he was trusting in the omnipotence of God. So he endured through objection. He also endured through rejection. Now we talked about that a little bit, but in Exodus chapter 5, verse 20. If you go there uh, back with me, Exodus 5, 20. This is after Moses comes and... Uh, he appears before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, Why should I obey the Lord? I don't even know the Lord. What are you talking about? I am God. And Moses said, God says, Let my people go. I'm just talking on the behalf of God. This is what Jehovah God says. So then after this whole encounter, not fearing the wrath of the king, Moses probably thought to himself, Well, I, I did good. I mean, I stood before the king. <laughs> I'm still alive. So he goes out, and the Bible says in verse 20, And they met Moses and Aaron, and who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. <laughs> They're going to receive them. They're going to be heroes. Verse 21, And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our Savior to be, harbor, uh, to, be, uh, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. He endured through objections and he endured through rejection. He's probably coming out of this thinking, we made it. And now the people that he thinks he's going to find comfort with says, who are you? Get out of here. We don't want you. You know, that would have been enough for me to say, you don't want me to be here? <laughs> I am not going to risk my life for you if you don't want me to be here. That's common sense. I'm just leaving. See you all later. Hope it all works out for you. But because of Moses' faith, not so. 
Sometimes we can labor for the Lord. We can try to witness to people or we can try to live the Christian life. And sometimes rejection happens. And may I say that many times for many Christians it is a time of discouragement because through the rejection and the opposition they say, well, they don't want me here so I'm just going to quit. No, no, no. When we give the gospel, just because people don't receive the gospel, it is not reason enough to quit. When we live the Christian life by faith and trouble and hard and difficulty comes and our family members oppose, it is not time to quit. It is time for us to endure through difficult times and it is time for us to even through objections and rejection. He describes for us in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, Down to verse 28. Notice what he says here. Acts chapter 7 verse 23. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now notice verse 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one, uh, at one again, saying, Sirs, ye have brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Mo Moses had really pure motives. I know he killed a man, he shouldn't have done that. But his motive was genuine. He wanted to deliver the children of Israel. And he knew that that's what God had called him to do. He went about it the wrong way. But he was sincere. He was opposed and he was rejected. If we live by faith, what comes with it is opposition and rejection. It comes with the territory. There's no way around it. So in other words... If there was no opposition, no rejection, then we're not living by faith. Not only do we see opposition, endured through opposition, endured through rejection, but he endured through complications. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord said unto Moses, I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. God comes to Moses after Moses appears before Pharaoh. And God says to Moses, you think, you know, God's going to deliver good news. And God says to Moses, I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I might show these signs before him. What was that? What did you say? Lord, could you repeat that? I, I didn't quite get it. I, I'm serving you and, and you're telling me that you've hardened his heart? But the end of the verse says that I might show these my signs before him. You see, we have tendency to focus on the I'm going to harden his heart and the heart of his servants. And with that in mind, with eyes not of faith, we forget about that I might show unto them my wondrous works. You see, living by faith is not about making ourselves comfortable. It is about bringing glory to God. I'm sorry to be the deliverer of maybe not as good news as you expected tonight. But Moses endured through objection, rejection, and complication. He was just serving God. And you know, there are many people sincere that want to serve God. And they serve God and... Objections. Ah. Well, it's okay. I think I'll be comfortable here with the people of God. Rejection. It's okay. I'm just going to keep serving the Lord. Complications. You see, those things will happen in our lives. And through faith, we must endure. Endure the difficult times, the trying times. So we see here, just one more thing, not only the persevering of faith, 
the forsaking of faith, the convincing of faith, the enduring of faith, but lastly, the understanding of faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Here is the all-important truth that reveals for us the secret to Moses' exemplary consistency of faith. He was fixed upon the invisible. Not just the invisible, on Him who is invisible. Let's go back to Hebrews. Notice chapter 11, verse 1. You remember what faith is? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 7, he says, By faith Noah, being warned of God in things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Notice verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. You see, the eye of faith can perceive much which the eye of flesh can never see. And the understanding of faith is as seeing Him who is invisible. Notice he says, as seeing Him. It's not just about kind of trusting in something you just don't know and you're not sure about. It is about seeing Him. You see, Moses was not fixed on something that he couldn't see. He was fixed on the God that you could not see. If Moses had been focused on Pharaoh's objection, the people's rejection, and the ongoing complications, then the world, then, then he would have quit. But see, his eyes were fixed, as Hebrews 12, 1 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And this verse does not say that he saw. This verse says, seeing. You see, the word seeing means Moses was continually looking at God. He did not take his eyes off of God. Through the objections, the rejections, and the complications. You see, what happens is when those things come inside our lives, we live by faith, we look to God until those objections, rejections, and complications come, and then we look at those things. You see, it forces us to look down upon our circumstances, upon our environment, and then we become discouraged. Why? Because we've taken our eyes off the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've placed our eyes on the opposition and not the omnipotence of God. You see, the eye of faith is seeing. That has the idea of a continual process of looking unto Jesus. It is seeing, notice Him, He says, who is invisible. One commentator wrote, he says, the word invisible shows the uselessness of making images to represent God and warns against our forming any apprehensions in our mind pattern after the likeness of the visible object. You see, the flesh needs something material or physical upon which to focus, but faith can focus on the invisible, for it can perceive the spiritual, which is the invisible, or which is the, uh, the, the opposite of the flesh. You see, the spiritual and the invisible is the opposite of what the flesh wants. And so, what was the secret to Moses? You see, why did Moses, by faith, forsake Egypt? Sin and the statues and all those things. And the Bible says, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. What, what enabled him to not be afraid of the king? And endured throughout all those difficult times. There's a secret. It's not difficult. But it's challenging. It's not difficult to understand, but it's challenging to apply to our lives. You see, in the Christian life, we are so quickly derailed. These Hebrew Christians were so quickly derailed by the persecution, by the opposition, by exactly what Moses went through, by the objection, the rejection, and the complications. 
as they were living by faith. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says here is a Hebrew Christian, Moses lived by faith. You see, Moses lived a life that was the exemplary consistency of faith. And he's trying to tell these Hebrew Christians where you have failed is you have not been consistent as Moses was in his faith. You've taken your eyes off of the Lord, who is invisible and spiritual, and you've placed your eyes on the material and the physical. Therein lies the danger in the Christian life. It's very simple. Taking our eyes off of Jesus. That's it. I wish I had more for you, but that's it. (laughs) Therein lies the danger. Taking our eyes off of Jesus. Let's follow the exemplary consistency of faith in continually seeing Him who is invisible.